Welcome back, Fantasy Fiction Fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today's class is going to be a world analysis, the first part of a world analysis, and it's going to be on the world from the Belgarid series. Now, please help me if you guys know what the name of this world is. I tried looking for it in the first book. I tried looking for it online uh, from other people. I couldn't find it anywhere. So if you know if this world has a name, please let me know because I could not figure out what it was called. Um, if it does have a name, maybe it doesn't. Maybe the author never felt the need to name where they're at specifically. Um, but if there is a name, please let me know because I have missed it and haven't seemed to be able to figure out what it is. <laughs> so sorry about that, but the world from the Belgarid series is the one that we're talking about today, and I hope that you will enjoy this first set of items that I'm gonna be talking about. So the first thing I wanna jump into is mythology. Now the mythology is super important, especially in this particular novel. So in fantasy in general, mythology is usually a big thing. There's usually gods that are more interactive. There's usually, you know, um, a lot of them, like a lot of different gods, or it's usually not um, just one. But this particular one is interesting because it is so much uh, affecting this story like it is completely woven through the story and the fact that the whole fight that we have is against a god so before we get into that let's go ahead and just break down this topic a little bit more um, so it's such a large thing in this world that everybody has a god um, all the creatures all the people generally have a god that they worship. At first, of course, we know that Ul um, was not always the god of his people and the creatures, but he became that. So at the point in the world that we are in the Belgarid series, pretty much every single being has a god that they worship. There are some that don't, but for the most part, there is a god that is worshipped by everybody and that they have um knowledge of this god like personal like they've actually interacted with this god in some way and every single you know group pretty much knows that the gods are real and can interact with and stuff like that so of course maybe not in this lifetime have they in this particular lifetime have they interacted with the gods but they knew at some point that the gods were real and were alive on earth and some of them still do get to talk to their gods some of them don't depending on which god it is and of course like i said not absolutely every single person in every single group does worship the gods but they do know at least of them and they know um, that they are in existence um, and they have usually had some kind of god at some point possibly in the past so it's just a really big, big thing in this world. Um, you know, so many of the gods like Ul and Eldur actually specifically still come to Earth and interact with their people that they watch over. Um, especially Ul, he's very much uh, involved with the Ulgos. He visits them and he uh, has very, uh, is very much, they're very devout people. They're very much all about the religion of Ul, so he gets a lot of worship from them, and he, so he graces them with his presence often. Um, Torak, like I mentioned earlier, is our main antagonist. So, as I mentioned, with the whole point of this book being about mythology, is that this particular god wants to take over all of the people and have all of them worship him and have all of the power of the universe for himself and to cut out all his brothers um, in order to just take it over <laughs> but that's the reason why we have the story is that they don't want that to happen the universe is not meant to be that way and so garyon must fight torak in order to save the world as it is and then of course, we have the fact that the god dies. Garion wins at the end, kills Torak, and it's sad for the other gods, you know? Like, the other gods were either uh, Ul being his father and the others being his brother, 
all mourn him along with the universe. And the people who worshipped him no longer have a God then. That is leaving a hole in their hearts, even if they didn't like being under that God, they didn't like how they were treated, it still was their mythology and their belief system and their whole entire culture um, that was now affected by the fact that their God has died and that there's no one there to watch over them anymore. Um, so again, some of the people are very devout to their gods. We've got the Ulgos who are very, very devout. We've got the Tolnadruns that really care more about money than gods. <laughs> and we've also got like, you know, the Grolems who are very much all about Torak. And uh, we've then we've got others who don't want to be sacrificed to Torak. So they're running for their lives and trying to um, do anything they can to get out of being a worshiper. So we have both scales. Um, even though they have a god, possibly, um, they don't always love that god. Uh, we have the Tolnadrons, like I said, that are really more about worshipping money and really care more about earthly things than they do about gods. And they're much more centered on the earth than on the sky and the gods. So lots of diversity as far as the mythology goes. So we have it such a big part of the world and we've got a bunch of diversity about who is cares about it and who doesn't. Um, the main three gods that are in this story, we've already mentioned several times in this discussion that I've had so far, but it's going to be that Aldur, who is the god over the sorcerer and sorceresses, or you could say like the god of magic in a way, um, he is one of the ones that is the biggest help and the biggest interaction that they have. Um, he's a very important god in this story. We've got two for Ul, who is the god over the Ulgos, and he is the father of the other gods. And he interacts, not tons, I would say, but we see him and he actually interacts with our main characters. We see that he is setting the path. We see him mourning his son when Torak is dead. So he has definitely more of a, uh, a presence in the story than the other gods do, at least in the first five series, the Belgarid series. And then we've got Torak, who Torak is only in it at the end physically, but everything about him is what the story is about. Um, he wants to rule the whole world and he is the main antagonist, the one that must be defeated in order for good to reign and for the life to continue to be happy. So though he is not a physical presence in this book, he is constantly a presence in the book. So those are my thoughts on the mythology of this particular world. It's very interesting. It's one of my top mythologies uh, for books because I really, really enjoy mythologies um, in fantasy novels where the gods are very interactive with their people, with the world, with events. I always think that that's really cool to read about and very interesting to see how the gods are going to affect things. So for me, I really enjoy this mythology and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. But go ahead and moving on now, let's go ahead and talk about magic. So magic is also very important in this story. I mean, it's kind of wouldn't be a fantasy without it. It would be more uh, historical if there was no presence of magic. And a lot of this would not exist without the magic. Um, but of course, it's very much a structured magic. We have rules. We've got um, reasons to use it, reasons not to use it. It's not just a cure-all overpowered ability here. It definitely has its place and it is very realistically done in my opinion. So we have only certain people have the capacity to do magic or the capability to do magic. So it's a limited thing in this world. It's not like everybody has it. It's not like, you know, we're just flinging spells left and right. It is a very limited thing and for example, you know, Sinedra's dad doesn't even believe that uh, magic exists. Doesn't believe in Belgareth and um, Pulgara. He doesn't believe in it all um, because it is so few and uh, his upbringing and his way of thinking does not allow for him to comprehend it. So it is definitely a um, 
important aspect of this world is that it's very limited and that affects how people view it and affect how people interact with the others that can use it. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that everybody has the ability to grasp magic if they want to. So everybody is born with the capacity to uh, possibly do it. But not many develop the capability to do it. It is unique in the kind of person you have to be in order to grasp it, to sense it, and to release it. So um, they talked about how Garyon eventually does develop his ability to use magic. And he asked, did you always know I was going to be able to use it? And um, Bill Gareth says it just depended on whether you were going to be able to be the kind of person that could grasp it and could commit to it and do what needs to be done in order to work with it. So everybody really has the ability within them, but they don't always develop the capability of doing it. So the actual working of magic requires the will and the word, which I think is really, really nice, really, really interesting. I think this is a little bit more of a unique um, magic, uh, what am I looking for? Magic structure or um, magic rule, like how the rules of the magic work. Um, so you have to have the will and the words. You have to have the will and the uh, soul of yourself being able to do the magic and then and, and picture it and know what you're going to do with it. And then you have to have the word where you say something to make it come into life. So you gather it in your soul, you gather it in your mind and your heart, and then you release it into the world with the word or whatever it is that you're going to say to bring it forth. So I really, really like that, that internal portion of it rising inside you and then the fact that you speak it aloud and then it comes to life. I just think it's a really pretty, really interesting form of magic. I think that that, it's very much an essence of a person and I think that that's really cool. Um, it allows people to do things, a lot of things, but I do like that it has limits to it. So it's not like, you know, you can just raise an army of dead. <laughs> like, it's not the magic that can just do whatever it wants, however it wants. There are laws to the rules of nature. There's laws to the rules of magic. You can't make things unexist. That will just come back on you and you will make yourself unexist by trying to make something else unexist. Um, you know, normally, other than Garyon, you're not really allowed to bring back the dead. Um, that's very much a unique thing for Garyon and it's not... Uh, an ability easily granted. It's kind of like the exception to the rule kind of thing. So it has its limits and it's not just used for whatever and at any time. Especially because there is the sound, quote quote sound, that is made that is detected by other magic users. So if you can use magic and you hear like somebody else does magic around you or even not around you, it depends depends on the kind of magic, you can hear a sound that you can recognize as magic being wielded and where, and possibly even by who. We don't really get into that, like of exactly knowing on the who portion, but you can definitely tell that somebody's doing magic and where it's coming from. So some things take, or, or is done really loudly, especially Gary on when he was not trained. Um, he's just making sound left and right based on um, his inability to control it as well. And then there are times you do very delicate magic that's very much very little sound. You barely make a whisper and maybe nobody would catch that you've done it. So I do really like that the concentration levels, the ability levels and how, you know, other people who use magic can recognize it in others as well as why it can be tricky because like in so much of the situation in this series, don't want the bad guys to know where they're at and so they can't use magic because they would alert people to where they're at. Um, and then I just really like how the orb is a very strong presence of magic and it can make anybody, a uh, any wielder, given immense power and even burns a god. It burns Torak's face and he it doesn't want to be with him. So not only is it sentient, but it can grant this amazing power and it can work amazing power on its own. 
and created by the god of Eldur. But it is very particular on who possesses it, and usually that person is not going to try and use it for its own gain. It's more of just keeping it safe. So I do really like the fact that this magical item not only is a little bit sentient in its own way, but it can give power, but it doesn't give power to those who actually want the power. It more resonates with those who want to just keep it safe and keep it out of other people's hands. Next, let's go ahead and talk about important locations. So we've got, um, I've got four important locations that I have mentioned for today's class. Of course, if you think I forgot anything, go ahead and let me know. Or if you want any more details about any of these places, let me know as well. This is again based off of our reading of the Belgarid, not the Malorium. So the first place that's very really important, I believe, in this story or is very precious to this world is the Vale of Eldur. So of course it is Aldur's part of the world. Like, I mean, he really, it's, it's a, his holy place. It's a very holy place to where most people will not go there. Uh, there is a lot of Torax followers who will not go there. Grolems don't go there. It's a safe haven for people there. It's a very holy place from Aldur. And it's really special because, you know, it's, Belgareth's home. That's where his tower is and where he was originally when he met Eldur and was taught by him, when he met his uh, late wife and the life that they had together was spent there. So it's a very special place for one of our main characters, such as Belgareth, as well as just the place is to the world a very holy, special place. Um, it has a, tr the, a tree that was planted back way older than any other tree it's probably the first tree that ever existed and it's the only tree that exists there um, it's very 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 special and old tree that is in many ways i feel like kind of connected to like the tree of life um, like from norse mythology where without that tree you know life would crumble so it's like that world that the tree is like blooming and happy and alive is a symbol of like this world being happy and healthy and it is also of course where the disciples of Aldur live in general uh, there's a couple others like Belden um, and the twins that live there so that's their home and that's their place and they have their even though they travel the world that's where they go back to and call home so it's a very very important place and we get to see it about halfway through this series, um, but it's a place that I think sticks with you even after you've left it. Next is um, Falder's Farm. So Falder's Farm is a, uh, important because that is where everything began. That is where Garion is raised and where he is safe and happy and where he learns his his base set of morals and his base self, I guess you can say, to being at the starting point of where he needed to be in order to make the journey and to change in the way that he needed to, to end up being where he ends up at, for being able to defeat Torak. Sorry, I feel like I'm going round and round in circles there. Hopefully I eventually got it out. <laughs> but Falder's farm is essential for being the place that everything begins and the place where Garion is set up to be the man he needs to be in order to grow and transition into being the savior of the world and to fight Torak. Um, and has his old friends and his old flame that he was kind of interested in. But a place that he then lets go of and moves forward from. And so it was his, his starting point. And that is always important. A starting point is always necessary for anybody. And I think that the Falder's Farm was really nice how he got to spend some time there and really see where his starting point was and how it shaped him. Next is the Isle of the Winds. So the Isle of the Winds is, you know, Garion's kingdom at the end. Like that's where he is the king of. But he's also the king of the whole West. So the Isle of the Winds is like the 
center piece. It's not in the center of it, but it's like the, the center piece or the HQ or whatever you want to call it of the West. He has that aisle that's his own that he's in charge of that is like the symbol of good and happiness and protection of the West people. So it's a very strong place to be and of course Garyon's going to make that his home from now on because he's in charge of it but it really is just the symbol the place that is the symbol of hope and goodness and having a leader that will lead them against any kind of evil that might come their way he will protect the west and that is the height of power for the west so uh just all good things that it shows unity and happiness and hope so and protection so it's a really really good place to be and we've had that powerful scene where Garion is coming into his throne room and he's got the uh the orb that he takes from Eren and how he connects it to the sword and shoots the sword up into the sky so it's, it has a very has very powerful moments there that we see in the story and it's a very powerful place for this world as a whole as well as for us as the readers and last but not least um, I couldn't find this one on the map anywhere I tried looking uh, so it's gonna be a little bit harder to like place it if you go back and look for it um, but Torax tomb is an important place for this story um, of course it's in Meloria uh, I don't remember exactly where, sorry guys, um, but I tried looking for it on the map that's like the zoom in of the area and it didn't have it located. Like it shows the tower for Belgaris Tower on the veil, but it's not going to show us where the tomb is. I don't know. Either way, the place, this is the place where fate and future is decided. So it's a very important place because Torek's our main enemy. Garion arrives there in order to take him down and he rises and they fight and he wins. So this is the place that decides it all and decides that the future is going to be good instead of bad and that hope is going to win off and freedom versus a god that's going to be oppressive and murder you <laughs> just because he can. Um, so this is the place where the whole the whole climax is decided with Garion killing Torak and where good overcomes evil so it's a very triumphant place as well as a very melancholy place because this is then where the gods mourn their fallen brethren and son so it's a very 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 sad moment as well as a very happy moment and it represents what will be in the future so let me know if you think any other locations are really important for this story or for this world i'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions but this is what I found for, um, were the most resonant for me as well as I felt like were most important to the story and to the world as a whole. Okay, last but not least, let's go ahead and talk about the unique features of this world. And by unique features, I mean something that is particular to this world in this series um, that you don't really find elsewhere something that's kind of uh, a quirk you could say and I had one thing that I thought was a unique feature of this world and that is that there is a sentient prophecy inhabiting the world or inhabiting the universe or whatever you want to call it um, or however you want to say where it's at I don't really know but there is a sentient prophecy that practically is a character here he's practically a person depending on who you are Garion knows him quite well. He's talked to him regularly and sometimes the prophecy still talks to him even after he has defeated Torak. Probably a lot less so now, but he has been, uh, talked to him a little bit. So this prophecy interacts with the world and the fact that, you know, it made that storm cloud that helped them get to Torak in the first place. It, you know, talked to the crazy guy in the past to write down the prophecy and the prophecy interacts with the world and it interacts with Belgareth and Polgara and even though they didn't directly, the prophecy didn't, you know, directly interact with Belgareth without Garion, it still had ways of shaping him and doing things. And so I think it's super, super interesting to have a prophecy that is actually 
part of the universe and is actually sentient and able to affect things and talk to people. And there was two of them. We only really knew one because we're, you know, on the side of good and wanting Garion to win. But Torak and his people also had one. And they kind of have a moment where when Torak is killed, that prophecy swells up and screams and is gone. Because obviously there's no way for that to have happened anymore. Um, but there was two of them at some point, And now there is just one. Uh, but I think it's super interesting and super unique to this world. And super unique to how this story goes. So I just thought it was something that we should touch on and is important. If you could think of another unique feature of this world, please let me know. I'd be happy to hear about it. I kind of racked my brain, but I felt like this was the most prominent unique thing to the Belgarid world. But I'd love to hear what you come up with as well. Okay, so this is just part one of the world analysis that we'll be doing. I'll go ahead and release more aspects about it later. Hopefully you enjoyed the topics I picked for this portion. And again, I would love to hear all your thoughts, your feelings, anything at all about what you think about this world. And if there's any specific topics you'd like me to discuss in later parts. Um, I think the last time I did the world analysis, it became three parts. And I'm guessing it's going to be about three parts again. So let me know if there's anything specific you'd like me to talk about in regards to this world. And I can add it in those later parts. Okay, before we close out, let's go ahead and go over the trivia question. Thank you so much to everybody who participated this week in the trivia question. Um, the question was about whether uh, about a series that it revolves around a wizard who is a PI in Chicago. And the answer to that is The Dresden Files. Congratulations to Kathy, who got that correct. Um, thank you so much to everybody, again, for who participated and sent in their answers. Hopefully you will get it next time. If you yourself are interested in checking out the trivia question and want to go ahead and uh, see what it's all about and see where it's at, go ahead over to the blog, fantasyfictionfanatics.net. It's going to be for desktop on the right-hand side. You'll just scroll down just a little bit, and you'll be able to see it and answer it. If you're on mobile, you'll have to scroll almost all the way down to the bottom, but you will be able to see it there and answer it as well. And next week, you'll be able to find out if you were correct or not. While you're over on the blog, if you'd like more content from me, you're welcome to check that out. I've got book reviews. I've got book recommendations. I've got my thoughts and feelings on different things about fantasy and reading and writing. I've got, you know, writing tips over there. I've got uh, things that are personal to me, other stuff like that. So if you're interested in more content and different content from me, hopefully you'll find something that you enjoy over there as well. If you'd like to get a hold of me and commenting down below is not the best place, you're welcome to talk to me through Facebook, which is slash fantasy fiction one. You're also welcome to talk to me through Twitter, which is at Fantasy Fiction One. Both places you can go ahead and direct message me, or you're welcome to follow me in order to get updates of both the blog as well as the YouTube channel. I like to post different things on there. I always try to also do sometimes some just fun posts or update you if I'm not able to film for a week. So I'd love to see you over there and follow me if you would like to get those updates. Though the best place to be, and this was where you're going to get the updates, talk to me, and get to talk to your fellow fantasy fiction fanatics, is the Discord. You can get your invite down below with the link and join up, and then you can talk to not only me, but your fellow fantasy fanatics. We've got lots of people over there right now talking, chatting, having a good time, discussing fantasy together, and as well as non-fantasy things as well. We just have a great time getting to know each other and having a shared interest that we can enjoy together. So hopefully we'll see you over there. And I guess that's it from me today. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.